Good morning. Good afternoon. Go ahead. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and apologies, I jumped the gun there. We are delighted to welcome you to UWC Diligent, albeit remotely, virtually. You will see later the opening video that I should have played before I jumped to give you flavor of the kind of a school we are. I am Gabriel Ernesto Abad Fernandez, Gabriel, and I have the honor of being the head of college of this beautiful community in Diligian, Armenia. 216 students from 80 different nationalities and 80 staff of about 17 nationalities in total working together following the UWC mission. Today, we hope that you will meet some of our staff, students, parents, and they will lead you through different parts of the school. We hope that you will get first-hand information and then we can answer your questions later on. So please, any questions you may have, do address them to us in the Q&A or in the chat. Let me tell you something about the school as a preamble. UWC schools are not regular international schools catering for foreign um, citizens or for the affluent local populations. The schools that are international where actually there's nothing international because all the students come from one country and the teachers from another country. That's not really international. UWC schools are based on deliberate diversity. What do we mean by that? We select students irrespective of their background, or the culture, the countries, the languages they speak, the nationality, and we bring them here because of the potential they have. Candidates apply to UWC, and if appointed, their families are means tested and the students are admitted to schools of their choice. Or based on the mix of nationalities we try to reach, it could be any UWC school. Our values, our admission process, and the UWC mission makes us different. We aim at enabling youth to respond to the challenges of a globalized world. We want to educate individuals who through their own action and personal example can make a positive difference in the world. And if we look at the news every day lately, we're desperately in need of positive good news. That's why we provide an education to our students that is independent of the socioeconomic means. Meaning if a student needs support to come and study here, that's why we have a comprehensive scholarship system. The UWC mission is to make education a force to unite people, nations, and cultures for peace and a sustainable future. UWC schools are usually from K to 12 high school, but they all have something in common. They all have a secondary school at the end for a student 16 to 18 years old doing the IB diploma or the IB careers program, which is the parallel IB curriculum for that age. In our case, UWC Diligent was established in 2014, the first international boarding school in Armenia and the only member of the UWC movement in this region. As I mentioned earlier, we have 216 students of 81 nationalities through the year. Though, unfortunately, we don't have students, for example, from some countries because of the way scholarships are allocated. And we always review that to try to bring further diversity. When I moved to Armenia myself, I found this beautiful country and this beautiful modern campus, which enables us to deliver a high quality education combined with opportunities for our students, physical and creative development, while also being active members in the community, both in Diligent and outside Diligent. The last week we had an Explore Armenia program. I was involved in four different trips cultural, seeing the beauty, the natural beauty of Armenia, exploring its historical legacy, its churches, its convents. It's an amazing place. UWC Diligent meets the highest international standards, including environmentally friendly buildings and renewal technologies that were employed in its construction. The school has received numerous awards for the quality, including the Sustainability Assessment Certification and the Build School 2017 Silver Award. Most recently, last summer, we received the accreditation, the international accreditation by the Council of International Schools, which validates what we do after a comprehensive review of all of our processes involving the full community. 
a beautiful cutting edge campus enables us to deliver a unique, what we call the UWCD experience. A host country, Armenia, our location and the campus are spices. But what does makes it special? It's actually our community. The staff, the students, the alumni, our supporters, our governors, they make the school what it is, this fascinating community. So I'm going to hand over to Caitlin unless we go first with a video. Thank you. Okay, sorry. All right. Hello, my name is Caitlin and I'm from Canada and I'm currently a first year here at UWC Deladon. And I'm super excited to, uh, to take you guys on a tour of our beautiful campus. Um, so right now we're actually right outside of our um, AB, which is, and we're at the main entrance right now. And I just wanna like give a little 360 because we're here in the National Park of Deladon and every time you go outside, you just have a beautiful view of the mountains. So it's really nice out here. All right, let's head inside to the reception area. So UWC, as I think Gabriel already mentioned, um, it was founded in 2014 by Ruben and Veronica, um, who are the founders and investors. All right, so now we are here in our reception area. We have a music room to our right over there. Um, and we're just gonna take you guys to uh, the atriums. So we're heading into our purple atrium and our atriums are just like a place where students can study, uh, sleep, talk to their friends um, and just chill out. And here's a little UWC mural or wall here full of uh, little tiles that students have done over the years. <coughs> All right, so here's the purple atrium. We have two here. The academic building is quite large. Um, so this is only one half, one portion of the whole academic building. What I really wanna show you is the green atrium, which is where we usually host our college assemblies, um, which is a weekly event that happens on Mondays where just all the, the whole college, 220 students um, come together. And so the Green Atrium is also like regional evenings or any events that happen here. So currently there's actually a regional evening practice that is happening. Um, and Yaro is one of the supervisors. So let's go talk to him. Oh. Hello. So this is Yaro. So if you don't mind, while we go up to the Visual Arts Studio, uh, please introduce yourself and talk about um, the Visual Arts course. Of course. Uh, my name is Yaro Zabrowski, and uh, I'm the head of the Arts Department, and I also teach Visual Arts. So uh, shall we go upstairs? Okay. While we're going upstairs, uh, just to tell you what's going on here, it is a rehearsal. Uh, in the atrium of the America's cultural uh, evening that's happening this weekend. And so uh, they are rehearsing uh, to represent and showcase their uh, cultures the best way they can. While we're going upstairs, uh, Just to tell you that uh, our arts department consists of uh, also extracurricular music course, uh, which allows uh, students to study several you know, music instruments, such as guitar, piano, uh, violin, and uh, Armenian native instrument, the uh, But it is not an IB course, however. Uh, it is still a chance for people to engage with music uh, at our college. Uh, in visual arts, Studios where we're going right now. We're very lucky to have them. They're very spacious and beautiful, and they're equipped uh, with facilities to allow for painting, drawing, print making, photography, both digital and dark from analog, uh, and uh, of course, painting and drawing. So 
many of our students, they never studied art before. And so here they have a chance to try things out and really experiment. So here we have, oh, here is the dark room where students can print images using cameras such as this one, an antique camera that still works today. Um, but next to it, we have our digital uh, lab. So the analog world and the digital world, they coexist. Um, the climax of the course is the exhibition, the final exhibition, which where students put their artworks and uh, showcase the result of their two years work. And the, here is our little ceramics uh, workshop with the potter's wheel, sculpture tools. Another interesting point to mention is that students also have personal spaces uh, in which they uh, can develop their work. So maybe we can have a look at a couple here. Sorry. On this, on this side. And uh, here's the collage area, the personal space. Maybe we can go on that side too. So it's a great course uh, for everybody who is curious about the world, about themselves, uh, how to express themselves artistically, and uh, gives a great uh, chance to try out different things using textile, photography, ceramics, everything. It really is like a lab in which uh, people develop their creativity, their critical thinking, uh, ability to reflect and uh, express themselves. Okay. So now we're just gonna head over to the other side of the visual art studio. So here's a little view of what's happening down below. <laughs> Maybe um, explain a little bit about what the site is used for. And uh, you yourself. Uh, uh, yes. Course, uh, <laughs> I also take visual, visual arts. Yeah. Take visual arts, guys. It's one of the best courses here. <laughs> Let's uh, see the view here. Maybe it's switch the camera again. Yeah. So what you see here uh, is a forest. <laughs> is a forest of easels, uh, because today we had our figure drawing workshop. Uh, in which students were practicing uh, drawing human figure and uh, uh, other students and staff members were actually posing today um, as models. So the, yeah, this is another, another studio that we have. And of course, uh, for theater, of course, we have wonderful facilities such as the Black Box Theater uh, where students are able to uh, put uh, together performances and uh, yeah, whole school performances and the, the personal uh, theater stuff. So yep. very, very lucky to have this. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much, Yara, for the visual arts um, tour. Uh, we're gonna head over to the library now. Thank you. Okay, good luck. <laughs> okay, so the library has three floors. The first floor, which we are going to currently head to, um, is where the reception is. And this is usually where you can find all the books, materials, textbooks for all your classes. Um, and this is where the library reception is. A beautiful library here. So on the walls, you can actually see um, there all the picture frames of all the alumni that have come before us, all the way starting from 2014, when the school was built. Um, and then over on this side, actually both sides of the library, you can see all the bookshelves. And then we have this beautiful, beautiful space to just <laughs> chill out and study. And there's also lots of computers here for use. All right. And the second floor and the third floor. So the second floor um, houses a lot of conference rooms, personal study rooms, um, where people can just have a quiet and private space to work on their homework or assignments um, and just study by themselves. 
All right, so that is the library. So now we're gonna head over to Marcel's room. And this is just to give you a view of what a normal classroom looks here um, in the UWCD campus. Uh, Marcel is the head of mathematics here. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about the subject and what you can expect when you come here about math. Um, right now we're walking past all the science classrooms, natural sciences, if you're taking chemistry, biology, or um, environmental sciences, this is what your place is gonna be at. Really quickly, this is just like a really cool space as well. It's like right by the windows um, and it's just like chairs and couches. On the other side, there is a piano actually for anyone to use. Um, so this is just another place, like a common room. You just sit, study and chill with your friends. All right, we're almost at Marcel's room. So this side of the academic building on the same floor, um, it's where all the math rooms are and we're at Marcel's room. So let's just go in and say hi. Hello, Marcel. Hi. Uh, would you like to just speak about a little bit about your experience and just what mathematics is about here? What mathematics is about? <laughs> okay. Uh, first, my experience. Um, I'm here now in my uh, third year at uh, in Dijon. I've been uh, a math teacher for quite a time and uh, many other different uh, international schools. Um, but this is my first uh, UWC uh, school, and I uh, I like it a lot. I enjoy it a lot here. I like uh, the diversity in the classroom with uh, so many students from all different places. Um, I also like to see that there's also many things that we have in common, like uh, we might come from all different places, but the way we have learned Pythagoras theory is the same for everybody. So uh, we're very diverse uh, in my classroom in terms of level, in terms of background, but there's also lots of uh, common things that we have here. Um, so, and uh, I enjoy teaching here. Yeah, We want to hear more from you. Uh, I, think. Oh, I think that's great. That's already yes. enough. <laughs> thank you so much for okay nice. thank you so much so all right okay. yes i'll just do a little quick tour of the classroom this is what a typical classroom here looks like um it's quite nice and nice to design all right so now let's head towards the outdoor facility um also known as just the sports hall so we have a huge gym we have a swimming pool, and then we have a second floor to our um, sports hall, which is like the weight room where you can work out. There's treadmills, a diff like a multitude of different workout machines as well. I think a lot of students like to go there after school or even before school if you have that ethic in you um, to just go work out, do some activity because studying can be a lot here. It's a big part of your life, so you also need to balance it out with a little bit of exercise and activity. All right, so we just exited the huge academic building. And as we go towards this sports facility, I also want to show you the med center. And this is a very important place here. Um, definitely very important to know. So here is the med center. And this is where all our nurses and all the med staff um, are at your aid all, all the time. This is where some students um, actually stay in the med center sometimes if they're not feeling well. Um, but it depends on your case. Okay, so we are going to go towards the field. The field is, I think it's a FIFA standard uh, approved field, which is like really amazing. I'll do a little tour of the sports hall, which is right beside me. And let's go meet Aharon, which is one of the outdoor experience coordinators. Um, so here he is. Hello. Hello, I'm Aaron. I am sports and outdoor instructor. I'm from Armenia. And we are now next to our football pitch, football field, and our sports building. As you can see, we are situated in such a location where we are next to the mountains. We have a lot of forest mountains to discover, to have a hiking and uh, all our environment for sports it's enormous because we have a full-size football field as you can see tennis courts basketball mini football volleyball basketball 
uh, also we have gymnastics. Right now we are doing rafting training in the swimming pool. During project weeks, we are doing the cavings in the mountains. One hour drive from Vivejan, we, we are going to Sevan, where we are doing uh, our water sports. And not far from there, uh, another uh, half an hour, uh, we are reaching to our the, the destination for our uh, ski resort, where we are doing skiing for the students as well. So we have a lot of opportunities that we are providing. Uh, during all the weekends, we are, have, we are having sports and outdoor uh, events and uh, activities. This week, we are going to have master class from Yerevan for badminton. So we have a lot of opportunities and we are all using all the environments and the uh, opportunities that we are given. Thank you so much. Okay. So this is actually where it's for ends of the academic building in the sports hall. Now we're going to pass it on to Madhu and Zai who are currently in the residential area, which is all the way back there. So thank you guys so much. And it's been a pleasure being your tour guide. Hello everyone. <laughs> So you have seen the exciting uh, campus facilities. Now, Zai will show you a little bit of uh, the residential facilities where students spend most of the time. Uh, I am Madhu, I'm the head of residential life and I teach biology. I've been in this college for last uh, seven years. So I would give you a brief, brief idea about how the residential setting is. Uh, we have divided the residential uh, part of the campus into two sides, mountainside and riverside. Of course, the names says why they're named that way, um, because the campus is between a river and a mountain. On mountainside, we have two tunes or houses. And on riverside, we have three tunes or houses. Each tune has its name, named after a mountain or a river and each uh, tune has between 40 and 46 students with a dedicated house parent um, who looks after them, who's the gu guardian of these students. And uh, before I pass it on to Zai, who will talk about the residential experience from a student's point of view, I would like to answer a question that came even before the Zoom, uh, this Zoom call started. And I would like to, is, um, read the question because I don't want to get it wrong. What are the school's lesson learned regarding communication with students, staff, and parents, caregivers after experience seeing both COVID-19 and the war in Nagorno-Karabakh in the same period of time? What would you change? What approaches did you deem valuable and effective? Okay, so to answer this shortly, the period from the start of the pandemic was very difficult for us as it was for everyone in the world. Having said that, I hope all our current and alumni parents would agree that we have done a good job in a very challenging situation. I say this with confidence as we have received strong positive feedback from parents and national committees that we are doing a very good job in communicating with all stakeholders. When the school had to close in March 2020, when the situation was totally unknown and we had to move into the online mode, it was the toughest time for our students and especially the graduating class of 2020. However, by September, we managed to get the full enrollment of the new class and all students returned. With our excellent medical and safeguarding team, we navigated the pandemic successfully by being open and transparent every step of the way. Uh, when the war broke out, we followed the same strategy and communicated with the parent community almost daily. In terms of lessons learned, the communication is vital to the trust between the parents and the school, and we will continue to maintain our standard and we will welcome any feedback from our stakeholders and we love to hear from you to improve more and more. Now I'll pass on to Zai, who will share the residential experience and show a bit of the residence. Hello, everyone. My name is Zai. I'm from England. I'm a quarter English, quarter Australian, and half Indian. Uh, I am a Toon rep for Akstev Toon, and uh, I live in RS. 
And something that I think is quite cool about the tunes in this school is um, that each tune is named after uh, either a river or a mountain in Armenia. So all of the tunes in Riverside are named after uh, rivers in Armenia and all of the tunes in Mountainside are named after the mountains in Armenia. And the tune that I'm in is the, named after the river that actually runs like uh, aside our campus, which is uh, called Akstev River. So we have a very uh, nice sound of Akstev River every time I open my window. Um, so the first thing I'd like to talk about in terms of residential life is just the sheer amount of freedom that we have. Uh, this isn't something that I would be able to say if I'd given this talk um this time last year because this time last year we were in a uh, covid quarantine of course because of the pandemic but uh i would say due to some pretty tireless work from the staff and from uh the med center as well we've been able to uh get everyone or enough people on campus vaccinated um meaning that everyone is basically safe to uh explore the country and uh, on top of that armenia has uh, COVID seemingly quite under control at the moment. So we've, um, since uh, the start of this, my second term, so since January, we've been allowed to be basically essentially free off campus, which has been an incredible experience to uh, see Dilijan and to explore, to go to the cafes, to um, go on hikes, like on our own. It's just been a wonderful experience. Um, another thing I'd like to talk about is something that we have only uh, started for uh, this term. It was a, a curriculum that had started um, a few years ago, but it stopped due to COVID, I believe, and then it uh, started up again, uh, which is the residential curriculum. In the residential curriculum, they uh, were essentially taught things that don't quite fit into the academic uh, schedule or curriculum. Uh, but are still important enough to be talked about. We learn things about consent, about sex ed, about sleeping uh, schedules, um, about the difficulties of moving away from home. And that happens every tune time, not every tune time, sorry, uh, in certain tune times, um, which uh, occur every Thursday, which basically is a time when you and your tune come together and talk and hear announcements, um, play games, is basically a time to connect to the people who are in your tune or house. Um, what else is there to talk about? Uh, would you say a little bit about how the rooms are? Oh yeah, the... sure. So uh, in uh, both RS and MS, the rooms are either two people or for four people rooms. And there are two different types of two people rooms. There's the what's known as a teacher's apartment, even though students uh, live in it, uh, which basically are like bunk bed rooms. And that's where you um, have, yeah, obviously bunk beds. And then you um, have two next to each other. And then you have a communal sort of kitchen that you can have like kettles and like portable stoves and stuff. You can um, have all of your coffee stored there, you know, wherever you want. And then there's also uh, just other, um, what's it called? Uh, there's just two people rooms, which are, is there a name for that? The two yeah, people I rooms? Mean, no, it's just rooms. two, tw yeah, twin, twin rooms, rooms yeah. Uh, which basically are two rooms next to each other. And they have a, like their own toilet that they share between uh, four people. So, um, oh, and then obviously there's another type of room, which is the four pe person room. And in that, as the name suggests, they have four people. There's no like uh, communal toilet for that. Obviously the entire corridor shares um, the toilet for the four people rooms. And when it comes to um, sort of communal living and that sort of aspect of it, there are four showers, uh, no, four showers, one bath and three toilets in each corridor. And um, so yeah, like, it's not you never you basically never get to a point where you go to shower and like you have to wait because usually people have different enough schedules um that you don't ever like really run into so many people that you can't find <laughs> time to shower um with regards to stuff like socializing i think that's a really exciting part of uwc Diligen that i've heard about other schools uh that i've heard about um is slightly different to other schools in respect to socializing, uh, Dilijan 
um, has like these beautiful common rooms that you can access. So would you like to show? Yeah, I will actually. Bit? Yeah. Okay, come with me. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. So, um, this is, well, currently we're in RS1. Uh, in Riverside, there are three uh, different like levels to it. There's RS1, RS2, and RS3. This is RS1, and we were currently sitting at like the reception area. And then there's a little um, table tennis table there. And then you also have these um, like slightly detached rooms as well, where people come to study or to talk or to watch films or to have meetings as well. So that's a really uh, fun part. And that's, uh, this is pretty much the only place in the residences that you are allowed to access every single minute of the day. Uh, obviously, apart from when you have classes, because you have to be in class when you have class. Um, but like, that's slightly different to the other uh, places on campus, because um, after check-in, um, you have to either be in your own corridor or like in any common room, which really isn't that restricting because um, there's so many common, there are six common rooms, no, seven, six or seven mm -hmm. common rooms uh, in the residences and you can basically find anywhere and at any point. So yeah, that's that's pretty much it from me. Um, feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A. And yeah, uh, let me pass it on to the student council now. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody from wherever you are watching us. Uh, hello, so everyone. Uh, thank you, Zion Madhu, uh, for the information you provided us with. Uh, we're extremely happy to have the opportunity to tell more about our wonderful school. And now we will talk a bit about uh, Student Council and what is it, how is it being elected. So I'm Natalie. I'm Lebanese and I'm 18 years old and I'm the core representative of SUCO. I'm Haraj. I'm 18, almost 18 years old. I'm also a core representative of Student Council. Uh, basically, Student Council is democratically elected body among students. It consists of seven members, five twin representatives. Twin is basically the houses you're staying in the residences. You got, uh, you got representatives for that group of people and two core members of the student council, which are elected from the whole student body. Uh, and now we would like to introduce a representative of the parent council. Uh, Magella, please uh, introduce yourself and the floor is yours. Yes, hi, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Magella Skantzebakken. I'm an Australian. I'm actually married to a Norwegian. Um, I live in Dubai and we've got three children who were born in Singapore and Cambodia. Um, you'll tend to find that a lot of families are like us. We're kind of, it, it's, it's a very, very multicultural, very, very diverse school, which we love. Um, I'm the parent of Sulway, who is a current DP1 student and also the parent of an alumni student, Surya, who graduated from UWC Dilajan in May. Um, I'm also the chair of the UWC Parent Council. Um, we're very, very lucky that the school um, encourages parent communication. Uh, they are very open to us, um, having a lot of contact with them and very open to any communication we have. So the Parent Council was actually created in 2021. And basically we just serve as a conduit to liaise between UWC leadership in relation to any issues they might have and with the parent community at large. Um, we've got four different uh, committees. There's an onboarding committee. So when new families join the school, we try and um, put families with well, basically we'll try and put you with, say if you are Chinese speaking, we'll put you with a Chinese speaker in your region, in your time zone as a parent buddy to support you. And the same thing all around the world. There's a lot of parents who put their hands up every single year to do this. And it's a really lovely program that the school have got. We also have a graduation committee and the graduation committee, um, we're just starting it up again now, getting ready for our, our next graduation. And that's a really nice graduation. It's a time when a lot of parents come to the school for the first time. So we arrange as a parent council for parents to get together the day before the graduation, to meet each other, to have a day out together. 
We also have another committee, which is likely it's a UWCD and beyond committee. So there we're thinking about um, internship opportunities and gap year opportunities for kids. And also within that, we're trying to connect kids and families and alumni, because there is an amazing, amazing network of people out there. We also have a fundraising committee um, and that's obviously, it says itself. So we try and fundraise because of course there are a lot of scholarships and a lot of students who would really benefit from going to UWC. So that's us, uh, we're always around. If any parents want to get in contact with us, we have parents who are happy to chat to you even if you're not in the school yet, we're happy to chat to you if you've got any questions. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Magella. And now we would like to address a couple of points. Uh, the first one is uh, student governance, how it's being done and what is student council, like, council actually doing. Uh, student council is basically the representation of student body in front of college leadership team. Uh, throughout our experience here during these two years when we're here, uh, issues, concerns, or suggestions, feedback are arising. And basically the student body is the one representing them. So I can state that the role of the student council is basically the bridge connecting the college leadership team and students. And I believe uh, student council is one of the tools which uh, makes this place and the whole community operate in a very successful and constructive way. Um, and then another point. So we have elections regularly. We have uh, about four, mem four representatives for each student that come throughout the two years that your mm -hmm. teenager is going to be in UWC. So you will see how we can actually, we learn how to actually communicate our issues with the administration and actually have a decent connection with them and communicate, to, communicate with them eye to eye and not as adult students, more of a relationship that is taking into consideration what we say and, into, and taking into consideration what they say. So it's more of a friendly environment that we are children to understand each other. In. Yeah. And the period of time we are taking our roles is, is approximately 20 weeks, which is basically the health of a school year. Yeah. So moving on, a concern that a lot of people have when they're going to send their children or when as a person you're not comfortable that much in English, you ask yourself how, na how native should you be to actually be able to join UWC since everybody speaks English. Believe me when I say this, English is my third language and I've learned it throughout my first year. I've, went, I've, I've been through a lot, but it, ne it never stopped me from communicating and it was never a barrier as, as you can consider that you will find somebody here that understands you if you need a word, if you miss something. And teachers are so willing to help you. Like they're very, very nice. They're never gonna be discriminated against anybody looking like, do you, do you feel like you're going to be judged when you come here? You're not going to be judged. You're not going to have anybody looking at you as like in fear because you don't speak English. So English is definitely not a barrier for anybody. Don't consider it a problem or an issue that you will have. You will learn. It's going to be okay. You're going to be just fine. Uh, I can totally relate what Natalie said and like when I came here my English not was isn't was not the one which is it now and so basically this place is also an opportunity to develop the like English language communication skills you might need in your further future because like English is the international language of the world which like we're aiming for to go and become global citizens uh, another point we would like to address with which uh, which what program we're studying it's academics and uh, academics is basically based on the international baccalaureate program we offer a variety of subjects economics global politics uh, math sciences. sciences arts music uh, a like, wide variety a yeah, lot uh, basically everything and we can talk also about case opportunities uh, just before that, if you're worried about how difficult the IB is, it's a rigorous program, we're not going to lie, but it's, it has, we have so much support that it's not difficult. It's just going to be rigorous and it's going to be a lot, of, a lot of things happening, which includes CAS and activities in the community. 
So about CAS, we have CASs are basically extracurriculars that the IB that are requirements for the IB. So you have creativity, activity, and service. So we offer so many student-led opportunities as uh, CASs. So everything, all CASs are led by students. You can open any CAS you want. If you want to open, if you want to open an, a Minecraft CAS, you can open it. Anything that you're passionate in, and you can join any CAS. We have. As far as activities, yeah, uh, we have activities: football, basketball, volleyball, every sport that Ahar mentioned before. There are classes, and then there are student initiatives, and I think they're working very well. Yeah, we have a lot of services. We have uh, local organizations. We co we have uh, tutoring, language tutoring, French, Arabic, Chinese. We have so much science with kids. We have a lot of services with the community, which allow us to be involved outside of school and actually learn a lot more than only in the classroom. And uh, let's connect to our administration. And we hope you found the tour and the discussions useful. If you were not sure about sending your child to this school, we hope now you're really keen on doing that. And right now, how they can apply, what can they do? So can we please connect to the administration? How can, how can your child apply, Petevic? How does one apply to UWCD? Hello, <clears throat> I welcome everyone. And uh, um, uh, I'm Datevic. I'm uh, one of the admissions team members in the, at UWCD region. And uh, I'm here to explain you any uh, application routes that you might be interested in and also answer any questions that you might have to come up to our end. So there are two main routes to apply to UWCD region, the National Committee and the Global Selection Program. If someone is interested in a scholarship place, then they should choose to the, the National Committee route. And there are over 150 National Committees in the world. They are usually run by the volunteers, by the alumni, by the educational specialists. So, if someone is looking for a scholarship place, they should apply by a national committee. It is, I would, um, I would uh, suggest anyone, I would recommend strongly anyone interested uh, in applying for the, for the class of, for the entry class of um, 2023, right now um, to find, to get connected with your national committee, because most national committees have open applications right now. And I think the, the, um, uh, the application deadline is very close to the end for some countries. So uh, of course the deadlines, the opening of the applications are different from country to country. But uh, making sure where you qualify to apply, where you are eligible to apply, uh, may take some time. And also um, taking, um, preparing recommendations from the teachers and preparing all sorts of documents may take some time. So, if you are, if you want to apply by a national committee, or if someone is interested, I'm just recommending uh, doing that as soon as possible. And the other very important route is uh, the GSP, which is Global Selection Program. Uh, global, if someone has, that has no, um, is not looking for a scholarship or has no issues with paying the full education fee to the college, then they can apply through the Global Selection Program. So the last, after the COVID, the selection via the Global Selection Program is run um, uh, online. And um, and uh, the date there are no there is no deadline specified at the moment, uh, but anyone interested to apply might be it might be in the applicant's interest actually to apply as soon as possible to sort out their plans for the coming 2023 earlier on I would say. And then uh, other than these two routes, um, I. Uh, I would also recommend anyone interested, even younger generation who do not qualify to apply right now, to, uh, to register their interest in applying or their in general interest to UWC diligence. By your registration of interest, I will uh, copy the link right now in our chat here. Uh, I hope we can wait a minute. I don't know if we can share it all generally, but I would very much like to share it. 
So yeah, here it goes. So the registration of the link to the registration of interest, which means the people will we will certainly get in touch with them. We will share more details about the application routes and how to get to um, college, but and also. Uh, share some newsletters and updates from the college, um, give them um, uh, knowledge about the upcoming programs in the college, events, short courses around the network in UWC, MUM program that our students are running, and many other things that any applicant might be interested in. Uh, I think um, uh, there is uh, there is also the, another route, the direct entry applicant, which which has a very limited uh, amount of places, and I will keep this for another time, and I will give the floor to you to ask another question to Mane. So Mane, what kind of young people are we looking for? What are the selection criteria? Hello, everyone. My name is Mane. Uh, I'm also part of the admission team and I welcome everyone um, on this uh, webinar together with Datavik today I'll help uh, you to get to know um, a little bit more about the application process to UWC Dilijan and I'll start by answering the question that Natalie asked. Um, following up on what Datavik said about the application process and the application routes um, although the application um, process for each national committee may be different and the application timeline may be different and the process is also different from the global selection program. However, um, all UWC selection processes are based on the uh, UWC uh, five uh, key criteria that are uh, common for all the UWC schools, all the national committees across the world. So there are five uh, key criteria, as I said. The first one is intellectual curiosity and motivation. It's about how curious you are about to, to learn about the world around you, to academics and beyond. Um, second one is called active commitment. It's about how much you're ready to to actually act on your beliefs um, and how committed you are to them. Uh, the other and the very important one is social competence. How well are you equipped to interact in a group, work with the group, be part of a team, be part of a group, um, especially um, since this is a um, boarding school, this is something really important, but in the educational process, the group, activities are also very important. The fourth one is about resilience, personal responsibility and the integrity. Um, you have heard a lot about how amazing this experience is, but we need to be honest with you that it is also a difficult one and a challenging one, and you need to be resilient enough to be able to go through it and really benefit from it. And the last one is motivation, how how motivated you are to, to succeed, to learn, to build those relationships and connections um, in this diverse community, um, and how motivated you are to promote the UWC mission and values. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mona, for your answer. Uh, there is another question. Uh, my son applied through the global selection process program and expressed interest for free schools. However, he could not list them in order of preferences. If he gets accepted, how is the decision being made to what college he will go? And is there any opportunity to express his preferences after being selected? Yes, the GSP, although there are no particular priorities given uh, in the application in the earlier stage, however, during the interview stage, the applicant will be asked about their preferences and their pre preferences will be certainly considered. Thank you very much. Another question. Do you have any suggestions on how to prepare teenagers for the UWC experience? And what is special about UWC Dilijan and how is it unique from other UWCs? Uh, yes, sure. 
Um, I would say there are no special and particular suggestions. However, an applicant with a caring attitude and character, sense of responsibility and idealism, open-minded in a sense that can approve these qualities during the selection time through their behavior, through their life experience and other situations like services, volunteering in their home country or community will most likely, this, this uh, these people who are able to convince us, they will be they will be able to win the selections. The applicants who have read and um, generally have um, uh, who are readers and can reflect a lot to their life and are much convenient to present themselves during the selections and have practice in debating and also uh, analytical skills. Uh, these sort of applicants. Um, uh, can stand out and can be confident as long as and um, and can express themselves more freely so that they are able to be competent enough to win a place at UWC. I think you can also uh, answer to this question, guys. How, how did you do? Uh, at first, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, as speaking from my point of view, how Dijon is unique, I believe it's like its location is like one of the most like biggest advantages it has is like surrounded with an amazing mountains and forests. It's beautiful all all throughout the whole year. And at the same time, I believe in Dijon, we find the right balance between the academic studying and then uh, being actually involved in extracurricular activities, being uh, influencing the community within the school and outside of the school. And I believe this is something UWC students are really seeking for. Uh, and uh, I believe also there are unique opportunities here. As, as being a, a football class member and I can be proud of our accomplishment, UWC Diligent will be the first school to, be, to actually participate in the Amateur League of Armenia. This is something I think we should be really proud of. What about you, Natalie? For me, when you say like UWC Diligent is a school, it's the people here and it feels like home. Like every time I go back home, I'm like, I go back to Lebanon, I'm like, I want to come back. I just, something that stands out is that we all care for each other so much that I know whoever I am with, I know I can count on them. Everybody here has so much and it's such a strong bonded community. It's not only students, it's staff members too. I can talk to staff members as if I'm talking to my friends. It's such a beautiful relationship that I have never, I don't think I will ever find again and I cherish it so much and it makes UWC Dijon like my home and I genuinely mean it when I say it. It's just such a nice feeling of being in a community that's united and then actually talks to each other, communicates and just shares these feelings together that are so nice. And another question, uh, do students have a possibility to learn foreign languages, which ones? Uh, personally, me, I don't take any new languages, but I think Natalie can elaborate on this a bit more. Okay, I am a language person. I love languages. So as academics, you have the opportunity to actually take four AB initial languages. Four. You have German, you have Spanish, you have Russian. Okay, so you have three AB initial languages. Sorry for the miscounting but you also learn a lot from people. You can improve any language here because you can find people from so many different backgrounds, so many different countries that speak so many different languages. So if you have in mind to learn, let's say, I don't know, Chinese, you can actually expand your skills with classes, service classes that actually teach languages, other than the academics. You also learn Armenian, since you're in Armenia, we offer also a basis of Armenian and you get to practice outside you will learn a lot of languages and you will hear a lot of languages next to you. So it's definitely based where you can actually learn more with like, different languages. Thank you, Natalie. And I believe another question is which people are really curious about what is the daily schedule of a typical WCD student? Uh, mm. 
Uh, I can speak on my behalf. Uh, this differs from every yes, citizen. This is different. really, really different. It is based on your priorities, what they want to do. Of course, the classes start at the same time for everyone, and like everyone has like a roughly the same amount of time for your classes. But after that, you have your own schedule. For me, usually, like I wake up at seven thirty, maybe have a breakfast, yes. then go to the library to study a bit. Then I have classes from eight, yeah, <laughs> and okay. before from eight thirty to usually four thirty, I have classes. After that, like I go do some like physical activities to refresh my mind. Maybe it's football, gym, like swimming pool. All the facilities we have here, I'm trying to like get used from all of them. <laughs> and after that, uh, I'm studying, having dinner, and then socializing. Yeah, and, and, and that's my daily routine. I usually I'm studying. Yeah, I'm studying. <laughs> yeah, that's my that's my daily routine, what you can say on your behalf. Okay, it starts similarly as I wake up at like seven thirty and try to go to breakfast. Do my classes from eight thirty to four thirty kind of. And later on I'm mostly I mostly have CAS, mostly service. That's just more of an active person. I'm more in service, but I also put like put, invest a lot of time in the region and evening. So as you've seen in the atrium, there is one going on right now, and I should be down there, but it's okay. And I usually invest a lot of time in this because it's a lot of representation of the culture, and I really like to focus on the cultural aspect and learning languages here since it's UWC. So it generally differs on how the, how your vision of UWC is and what you want to prioritize. And then I have dinner, and then it's my studying time, slash I study with my friends, kind of, because I can focus more, and at the same time I socialize a bit, so I don't feel like I'm in my room all the time. I barely go to my room. But yeah, that's my daily schedule, kind of. Mm. Next question. Uh, yeah, next question. On average, how long does it take for year one student to settle in? Uh, I believe uh, this also can differ pretty much. Yeah. For some students, they're really outgoing for people, and then it will be really easy to adjust to the new community. For some people, it might be one of the challenges they face here, and like the people around them will help them to overcome. But I believe it won't take like longer than a month, like a to month fully is... settle in. After a month, you get you familiarize yourself with everything almost. You will still learn; it's a learning process. But then you will be pretty familiar with everything in one month. How people come and adapt is what differs from a person to another. Personally, for me, it was not that big of a challenge. I mean, I, I was pretty happy that I was here. It was very exciting. Some people find it very overwhelming at the start, but then it just gets better. It won't take longer than a month, usually. Yeah, and now uh, we will address the questions from uh, question box from Q&A side. Uh, Mane, in the future, will there be a pre-IB grade 10 program? Thank you, Viraj. Um, as uh, you may know, we were uh, intending to launch a foundation program, a uh, one-year uh, program before the IB. Um, however, uh, we, when we explored the demand for it, one of the things that is really important for us is the di diversity of our cohort. And one of the reasons that we decided not to move forward with it was that the uh, interest was mainly from uh, one region. And we realized that if we were to launch it, we wouldn't be able to have that diversity uh, of the cohort and that uh, multicultural uh, environment and experience for our foundation year students. So we decided not to move forward with it. Right now, we're not intending to launch a, a foundation program in the near future. However, we might come back to it at some point later to explore that possibility again. Um, and yeah, and I would like to also say that uh, if uh, for some reason we don't manage to answer all of your questions today, please feel free to reach out to us via emails. We're really good and fast at answering them. So we want to make sure that we you get the answer to your question just in case we don't manage to do it today. 
thank you very much, Mana and Dotevik. I believe all the answers were like pretty useful. And uh, at the end, I want to thank everyone who joined the meeting. We believe this was helpful for all of you. And now we would like to watch the story of UWC Dilijan. Thank you, everyone, for thank joining. Thank you. participate in this uh, dream our school in Dilijan is an international boarding school which will attract the kids all over the world the community of like-minded people who think globally and feel a sense of responsibility towards the future of the world in 2006 about this project. It looks like a crazy idea and now it is reality. Every graduate from this school dedicates a small piece of their future lives, keeping connected, keeping supporting, keeping giving advice. We'd like this experience to be something you want to share with future generations. 